Welcome to the eighth Food for Thought event series, a valued community tradition of Trinity University for more than 30 years. Tonight's discussion is brought to you by Trinity University Alumni Relations and Development Division, as well as Trinity University Press as part of our commitment to lifelong learning. I'm Tom Payton, director and publisher at Trinity University Press, and we're delighted to partner on this program. As a nonprofit cultural and educational publisher, we are committed to an evolving agenda of work that engages questions and brings us together as a community in tangible and productive ways. Tonight, we're discussing the new book, Revolutionary Women of Texas and Mexico, Portraits of Soldaderas, Saints and Subversives. We're delighted to have three of the editors and contributors to the book with us. And I'm happy to introduce Kathy Sosa, Norma Elia Cantu, and Ellen Rios Clark to tell you, and I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. Kathy is an artist and educator from San Antonio. She received national recognition for her traveling exhibition, Huipiles, which debuted at the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington, DC, as part of the Smithsonian Latino Center's programming. Her work has been featured on CNN and in Fiber Arts Magazine, San Antonio Woman, Country Lifestyle, Destinations, and other outlets. Sosa and her husband, Lionel, recently produced the documentary, Children of the Revolution, How the Mexican Revolution Changed America's Destiny. Ellen is Professor Emerita at the University of Texas in San Antonio. Her research examines ethnic and cultural identity. She's the, re she's the recipient of three National Endowment for the Humanities grants and director of the PBS program, Maya and Miguel. She is executive producer of the Latino Artist Speak series and has many publications, including Multicultural Literature for Latino Children and the forthcoming book, Pandolce, a, Com a Compendium of Mexican Pastries. She's also a graduate of Trinity University. Norma is the Noreen R. and T. Frank Murchison Professor of the Humanities at Trinity University and Professor Emeritus at the University of Texas, San Antonio. She edits the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo Culture and Traditions book series, and her articles earned her an international reputation as a scholar and folklorist. The latest of her many published books is the novel Cabanuelas, and she is editor of a forthcoming collection of contemporary Latina poetry. We welcome questions from you at the end of the discussion. Please submit your question at any time during this presentation using the Q&A box that you see on your screen. I'll also note that the book is available to you at a special price using a promotional code and link that you'll see in the chat box also on your screen. And now I'll turn this over to Norma who will guide this discussion this evening. And thanks again for joining us. Gracias, Tom. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the spirits of this place that is the virtual Trinity campus and food for thought, and also all the spirits of all the people, the women that are in this beautiful book, all of our ancestors asking permission for the work we are about to do, and in, invite you, all of you, wherever you are, to join us by asking questions. Es una plática, a chat among friends. Y con eso, I'm going to begin by asking Kathy how this book came about because I know the story, but maybe our listeners, our viewers on the other side of the screen may not. Well, thank you, happy, happy to be here. Um, the story begins in 2009. I was in a folk art shop that I love uh, called Cosas in Bernie. And a gentleman who is now my friend, but whom I did not know at the time, walked up to me and handed me an essay um, and asked me to take it home and read it, which I did. And the essay was short, it was a, a page or two, but it was all about the impacts that the Mexican Revolution had made on Texas and the United States because of the fact that it drove so many people, a whole tsunami of people moved from Mexico to El Norte to escape the revolution and settled here and stayed and they and their children and their children changed the future and the face of Texas and the country. So uh, that was 
you know, he, he made that assertion in the essay and, and I took the essay home to my husband who had told me the stories of his grandmothers who never knew each other, but who had, who each had a story that mirrored each other. They both came to the United States during the Mexican revolution, neither one with a husband or a male companion going through a war-torn country, finding their way to the train, getting on the train and getting down in San Antonio with little kids, right? And we had never thought that that was more, we had never thought of it as more than a random coincidence. So we said, well, is this true or is it not true? You know, if it's true, why don't we know it? You know, was our basic question. And then we said, well, if it's true, we can ask our friends who are of Mexican descent if they have an ancestor who came during the Mexican revolution. And if this fellow, Lance Aaron is right, then a lot of them should say yes, correct? So we went to a restaurant that we loved, that we were, we were there all the time. It's not there anymore. In fact, this week in the, in the paper, it was like a picture of it being demolished so they could replace it with something else. But everybody went there at the time. So we went and we sat in the booth that we frequently sat in and as friends of ours came in, we just invited them to our booth to answer that simple question. Do you have a grandmother or a grandfather or an ancestor who wouldn't be, wouldn't have been in San Antonio were it not for the Mexican revolution? And every single person said yes. And we knew at that moment that we were really onto something, that there was a big part of history that people should know uh, and understand and wrap their heads around and be proud of that wasn't in the history, it wasn't in the book that you're taught Texas history from as you're growing up as a young person in Texas. So um, we took that confidence and decided that we would try to improve that by making, uh, oh, we had a whole list of things we were gonna do, a, a documentary series, a, a, a coffee table book, a book about the women. And so the first two things happened fairly quickly. Um, and the book about the women uh, it has come out just, just now. Um, it has uh, that, that, and that's its birth story. You know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long gestation period, but you know, given how the book is being welcomed, uh, I can't help but feel that she's coming out at just the right time. You are so right, Kathy. Every book has a story, a life, and the birth story for this book is so beautiful. Thank you. Ellen, you and I have talked over the years about the need to have strong Chicana and Latina women out there as role models for our youth. And uh, with all the hundreds, if not thousands, of revolutionary women on both sides, in Texas and in Mexico. How did you come up with these 18 to highlight? Well, 18 women do not reflect all the women that, of course, have had this incredible journey. Uh, we got to remember that we're just talking about the Mexican Revolution 1910. And so what that episode in Mexican history had to do with who we are here in San Antonio. Many people were here way before 1910 in Texas because it was part of Me it was part of Mexico. So many, many people have had multiple generations here. But a large, large group of us our relatives or our grandmothers or great-grandmothers came because of the revolution. So how do we select the, these? Well, let me tell you, it took a lot of discussion, a lot of going back and forth between Kathy and I and Sandra Cisneros. Who are these women? And of course, we couldn't tell all the stories, but we figured that the stories we selected would be reflective of all these women. So we decided to divide up the book into three segments, post-revolution, 
the revolution, and now the contemporary part. So that made it a little bit easier to narrow it down to maybe 100 women in each, in each stage and still having to um, even reduce that way down to the 18 women. So yeah, what it took was a lot of research, a lot of talking, a lot of discussion. What kind of women should reflect this? So probably going back historically was a little easier that we could talk about the significant women in Mexico that reflected this. So we, even that alone was a reflection from La Virgen de Guadalupe. So here you have a saint to reflect a revolutionary woman. And then of course, La Malinche, you know, from, from the conquest. And then even the soldaderas, the people who were part of the revolution uh, itself. So re reducing it to those three arenas. And then we figured, thought about who are the women that no one really knows about and also identified another group, likewise in the, in the next one. I'll just say that we have probably enough names of women for 25, 35, 45, 100 books. What I think has made this a wonderful start to documenting the history. And you ask me, why is it important? It's important because as Kathy said, we're not reflected in the Texas history books, nor are we reflected in the US history books. So it's a way of, of documenting some of those significant change agents and significant women that had a huge impact binationally in Mexico, in Texas, and in San Antonio. So I wish, it, I wish we had videotaped and, and um, recorded all those dynamic discussions. And I guess we had a few arguments about who should it be and who shouldn't it be. But that's kind of an overall view of how we figured it, the first 18 women that we came down with. Well, it's a beautiful selection. And Jennifer Speed, who is also one of the co-editors, uh, wrote a wonderful introduction as well. And you have an, uh, a preface from a foreword from Dolores Huerta, which is amazing and, and so uh, well suited being herself a revolutionary woman. And then there's so many different women. I learned so much reading the book at different stages because there were women I had no idea, I had not heard of. Others, of course, like you were saying, were well known. So I think it's there's something new for everyone, even people who think they know all the <laughs> revolutionary women. Um, Kathy, you did the artwork for the project and I see the artwork behind you uh, as an artist. Which was the most challenging of these women to depict? Wow, that's very interesting. Um, and what was the process? I imagine you had photographs, but not of everyone. <laughs> I'll tell you the process because I didn't do the illustrations alone. My husband is a great artist and he and I collaborated on the illustrations in the inside of the book. The cover of the book is a, a painting that I did and submitted for consideration. It wasn't the only thing considered, but it's considered that for the cover. But our process was I would, I knew more about each personality, right? Having gone through this process. So I came to the table with a story of who the person was, uh, some photographs, um, you know, and even, even people who were alive before photography, people have imagined them uh, and they, and we think we know what they look like because people have imagined them and drawn them and put them as tattoos on their arms and, you know, all, all kinds of things. So I found as many images as I could. I, I came to the table with an, a concept of how to depict this person um, as something of an icon, really. It's really iconography is how I think of it. It's not, it's not realism. It's not a, a realistic portrait. And that allowed us to put everybody in the same style, right? people we had photographs of and the people we didn't. 
but as we were, we were approaching them at, uh, as a certain style. So I, I brought the story. I had an idea of what the symbology would be. Lionel did a beautiful pencil drawing, very realistic. I kind of obliterated it with my, <laughs> with my pen. And from, you know, starting with his beautiful drawing and, and really kind of, uh, I want to say it was a, almost a destructive process. I took a lot of that off, you know, a lot of the very realistic shading and stuff and made it into a, a, a pen and ink drawing. And I have really enjoyed the process. It was really, it was probably more fun for me than it was for him because I didn't have to watch him erase <laughs> what, what, what I had done or change what, what I had done. But I really enjoyed the, the final product and people are really liking it. In fact, I think, I think it's going to be a coloring book by next year. The illustrations from the book and a few others of contemporary women alive today. And I also noticed that in many of the images, you illustrate um, with symbols because it isn't just the character's face or body, but also, for example, for Maria Concepcion Acevedo de Lata, whom I did not know, <laughs> I really learned a lot. And by the way, the book is not just uh, biographies. These are critical analyses. Often they also integrate some kind of poetic approach to that life. So we get a very rich context of where that woman lived, what was happening in her life, why she was revolutionary or what we would call revolutionary. The, um, her picture, I don't know if you can see that, has a dove on it and uh, that, uh, or it's a, I don't know, it's an animal, I can tell. But it really t uh, taught me that she was in touch with that. But I also learned a lot about the Cristero movement because she was important during that period of Mexican history that many people ignore or forget or don't even know about. They know about the revolution, but not about the Cristero movement. And so, Ellen, for you, as you were putting together the book and the three sections, as you mentioned, so that it is the revolution and then the more recent one and going all the way back to basically pre-conquest because La Malinche was alive before the Europeans ever got here. So how did you um, kind of internalize or how did you choose how the authors that wrote the essays and the specific biographies? Um, I am an academic, so I was familiar with a lot of a lot of the writers who have, again, it's not a huge number, um, the historians, the Chicana and Latino uh, historians uh, who have been writing about some of these women. I also knew a lot of the literary people who have written literary works, um, so which is also another interesting aspect. And then some of the journalists. So we had a variety of people from academics, true historical accounts, you know, from their perspective, uh, and then from the literary people, an interpretation of what these people meant in, in their own writing. And then journalists who have a, another kind of style of, write, of writing. And I think that that's what makes the, the book so accessible to everybody, that it's not just a cut and dry uh, historical rendering of someone, that there is a very different approach to what, what is said. For example, Elena Pantowalski's uh, a presentation on the soldaderas comes from a poem of hers, you know, a literary piece. And that again gives it this whole different other light about it. There's some authors that probably nobody, had, not too many people had written about that we were able to find some work on. The in, I think one of the ones that gave us a challenge was to write about La Malinche, because La Malinche is a Mexican figure who holds a very um, controversial role in even in Mexico, because we can attribute so many things to her, the conquest, us as mestizos, and, um, and in some arena, she might be considered a sellout, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so 
one thing I held very firm to was that no one here in the United States should write about La Malinche. That was my personal view because I felt that the Mexicans really were the ones that, that could analyze, do that critical analysis of her from, from whatever arena that they wanted to do. Um, and so that probably presented the most um, interesting aspect of that because even a lot of the Mexican women did not want to write about La Malinche. So work has been written about her, but usually by men as for most of this work. So how did, how to find something that was more um, easily uh, read about or taken? Well, we found of all people, Laura Esquivel, who is known for like water for chocolate, a literary writer, but also a diplomat in Mexico. And she had written a book. And so we asked for her permission for to use the, a chapter on La Malinche from her book. So it was kind of a safe way mm -hmm. to, to bring her into our being, but also a way to understand how Mexico views La, La Malinche. So that gave us the variety of, of people. And then um, Sandra Cisneros, who writes beautiful detailed work about anything that she writes about, but who has this fascinating, uh, or is fascinated by Mexican music. So very, very logical that one of her heroes in, in the musical world is Chavela Vargas. So we didn't ask a musician to write about Chavela Vargas. We asked Sandra Cisneros to write about it, who could give us this beautiful interpretation of what she comes to mean. And then, like I said, we have journalists who wrote about other people from Uvalde, uh, people from, from other parts of South Texas, uh, including your hometown of Laredo, uh, to write about people that they might, might have known or had a significant part in their growing up or learning about in school. Yeah, speaking of Laredo, um, I was surprised to see Alice Dickerson Montemayor in here, a good friend of mine uh, that I met when I went back to teach in Laredo in the 80s and her work. And I was very pleased to see her included, along with others, uh, Teresa Orrea, that Sandra also wrote about, yes. uh, Teresita, La Santa de Caborca. Yes. Uh, there's Gloria Saldúa that you wrote about, Ellen. And I was so pleased to see the, the diversity, the variety of characters. But aside from all of that, I think the conce conceptual framework for the book the fact that these are all revolutionary women who come with their own baggage, everyone from their own space, and create something that is revolutionary and leave us a legacy. And I think that is also part of the attraction and the way that we can present these women as role models. Because mm -hmm. it, they were not necessarily big name heroes. I mean, they were just common folk who did what they had to do. Kathy, you were going to say something. Uh, and yeah. they didn't necessarily set out to be revolutionary. Right. You know, some of them did, some of them, you know, but most of them did not. It was, uh, it, it came to pass that something needed to be done, you know, that something needed to be accomplished, that something needed to be overcome that a wrong need to be righted. And they had no choice but to do that. And in the process, uh, they committed revolution. You know, they changed the established order uh, in, in the time and place where, where they lived. You know, they, they caused a transformation in the society where they lived and they provided inspiration for the women who came after them up to the women right now that, that are, are saying, you know, am I going to stand up and assume a leadership role? Who is it that looks like me who's done that in the past? Um, and so these stories continue to be an inspiration to uh, women and girls who are saying, what is my place in the world? 
how do I take it? I think one of it, it I think the whole idea of revolution is, is turned upside down with this. We tend to think of it with guns and violence and a male figure uh, doing a revolution. And it's not necessarily that. So again, like, like Kathy said, the idea of who is a revolutionary person or what is the definition of a revolutionary act. And I think that again spurred so much discussion among us that what is a revolution or what is a revolutionary woman? And is it something that you decide upon or it just happens as Kathy says? No, sometimes it was very deliberate like, like it was with Sor Juana, very deliberate of fighting back against the church and very deliberate about saying, if I can't study, I want to go to the only place that will let me study. So very, very decisive decision. But it is that these are women who are change agents, who for whatever reason changed the world around them and change the, the historical path or footprint. And like you said about Dolores Huerta, um, my privilege to interview her for this forward and just to know what her idea was of a revolutionary woman and all what it meant in terms of a deliberate choice that your life is going to be different and it might not fit everybody's definition of who a mother is or who a teacher is or who is a revolution. So all the sacrifices that these women underwent to be able to change the world around them and then for their legacy uh, changing it for generations uh, to come. Yeah, and some of them are of course individuals because they make that choice for themselves as individuals. But uh, some of the ones featured, you mentioned Elena Poniatowska writing about the soldaderas and then uh, Klein writing about the zapatistas. So it's a collective movement. Now in those two cases, it's military or political, but there are others that are not, that are individual setting out like Sor Juana that Alicia Gaspar de Alba writes about beautifully because she has also written novels. And that's another beauty about the book is that you have novelists like Sandra and Alicia and Laura Esquivel, but you also have scholars that uh, like Jennifer and Jennifer Speed and others who are historians, uh, Cynthia Orozco. I mean, these are scholars writing about particular uh, women. I'm suspecting that they self-selected because I know Cynthia has written about uh, Montemayor before, but I wonder if you assigned people topics or women to write about. And we only have another 10 or so minutes and I'm, I'm getting a little anxious because I have so many questions. <laughs> so can you tell me more about uh, that, that negotiation, um, Kathy? Specific people, we, we discussed it among ourselves and Ellen would say, um, I, I, I recommend Alicia because she's she knows the most. And so let's see if we can get her. Uh, a friend of ours who uh, was not a part of our team and isn't even a, a woman who suggested including La Maliche, uh, Arturo Suarez said, well, you know, if you could get Laura Esquivel, it would be very meaningful to audiences on, on in Mexico and in Texas. Um, and I have to interrupt you because I read Laura Esquivel's novel on La Malinche a long time ago when it first yeah. came out and I didn't really like it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like the ending. I didn't like her perception oh. of the relationship with Cortez. And yet you selected a section that, that was fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> Which I thought was really perfect. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, it's it's not that easy to, to look through a, a, a body of work and pick a, a small piece that might tell a whole story. But, you know, I just, you know, became familiar with the books, selected that, passed it around, 
everybody said yes that would that would that would be we think that would be good but to tell you the truth it, it's it i i don't want us to not uh explain the point that you know we're saying right now oh it's such a beautiful thing that some of the pieces are literary and some of the pieces are scholarly and some of the pieces are reportage but the truth is that's revolutionary in itself go figure this isn't done we didn't i i didn't know that ellen probably did Jennifer probably did, Sandra probably did, but I didn't know that. I had, I was, uh, you know, um, completely unaware that this book would be challenging to publish, if you're a publisher, because it doesn't fit neatly into some uh, category. It's a real hybrid. It's a real <laughs> hybrid. It's, it, it's bi in many ways. It's bi-national, <laughs> it's bi-cultural, it, uh, it's, uh, it started out bilingual. We, had, we translated uh, some of the pieces. Um, so yeah, it, it is, you know, that that is an unusual and an important part of it. In fact, you know, we've been looking for places to enter this book for recognition and it doesn't fit in, it doesn't fit neatly into categories that people recognize, give recognition for. So um, I, uh, I feel so glad that we were able to sell this concept of uh, some of them are going to be like this and some are going to be like that because I I felt and and Ellen felt and Sandra felt that the great part about it is there's something for everybody. You know, if if you if you're a scholar and what really what you really like is that detail and the fact that everything is researched and cited and all of that there's some of those and if you want uh, uh, a non uh, a non-fiction account a literary account there's some beautiful samples of that and the reportage is well done um elena yala's piece on genevera morales exquisitely done i think um so anyway that the you know the binational nature of it is revolutionary and the mixed genre nature of it is revolutionary and then the simple the simple thing that sandra always says is if you don't tell your story it'll be like you never have so just telling the stories is a revel telling our own stories is a revolutionary act you know? absolutely yeah. Ellen, um, I'm just going to go right into my last question and see for both of you, really, what's next? Now, you have talked about, Kathy, a coloring book. And Ellen, you talked about all those other women that were not included. Uh, are these two possibilities for the future? Where are we going with this? Well, I think one of the other things about it being revolutionary is that what it's going to spawn and, and I think that it's going to give young academics new topics from which to select from and that they can research and write in an academic style about women that no one has ever heard of, but women who created change, who sacrificed, ex changed the status quo, et cetera. And that the, the, I think we firmly set a rationale for the writing of of women who look like us that are not in the in the book. And by that, yes, I do mean women of color, but also women of very different, of very different backgrounds. So I think that we we might have a second edition to this, but hopefully for me, it was gonna be what is that next generation of writers or collaborators? What is it that they can come up with? What revolutionary concept? I think the concept of turning a book such as this into a coloring book is revolutionary in its own because it's going to affect kids and it's going to affect adults because adults are going to want to color these wonderful, wonderful uh, black and white images. So I think there's a whole revolutionary change coming about. <laughs> Kathy? I feel, I feel that I want to echo that, you know, it, we will be successful. Our success doesn't depend on how many books we can write after this of the sequels. It depends on how many young scholars and writers are inspired to pick it up and do more of it themselves. To me, that's the real definition of 
this. And that's where the coloring book is going to come in handy, I think, because the more it gets into hands of uh, uh, younger adults and younger women and teachers and youth in classrooms, the way we're going to set up the coloring book is you know, you're going to color this page and on the back of the page, it's going to tell you about the person. And so you could, you could take that page out and save that page if that's your favorite person, you know, or more than one of your favorites, you know, it's, it'll be a self-contained page with this, this is my art and I chose this because this person inspired me. So, um, I'm again, super grateful to uh, Trinity University Press who I, uh, I, I feel like is gonna pick up the ball on the coloring book since coloring book is not in their house today. <laughs> but if they do, uh, hopefully uh, uh, it will be rewarding in much the same way that this book has been rewarding because I mean, I, I, I didn't expect this kind of uh, reception for the book, I don't know about you, Ellen, but it, it but it is really. <laughs> well, you know, Norma, Norma, there's a wonderful question there about um, that all these about the women having passion, and they all had someone who listened, and um, and basically the question is that we select these women because they had passionate and a voice, and that's a interesting. Fascinating question. Uh, yes, I think that we selected them because of passion. Passion is what made them stand out, just like Kathy's standing out with her artistic passion. But the voice, did they have a voice? And I, I don't know the answer to that question because did they have a voice with what to say what they thought or what it came to be? I don't think all of them had that at that point when they were in the act of a revolution of the revolution. Some of some of them, of course, did like like Sor Juana and others. So I think that that they might not have had the opportunity to articulate what their voice was and what that voice meant and what they wanted to to tell after the fact because they were in the process of doing with their passion and, uh, and just creating that pathway. So in a sense, um, goes back to your other question, what's the next step? And I think that is to formalize the voice for a lot of these women that had not had the opportunity to have a formalized voice by, and by that I mean the documentation of their voice. That's an excellent question though. Yeah, and now we, we have transitioned into the questions. There's another, it's really a comment. It says, maybe a project with the musically inclined to create corridos. Ooh, that's a nice one. Isn't that's that a great nice. one? Yeah. And I suspect some of these women already have corridos. I think Dolores Huerta does for sure. Um, but that is something that would be a really good project. I'm also thinking about maybe a teaching unit, some kind of module for um, elementary and high school students, but also even for women's studies courses where you can have, um, each one could go off in other directions. And I see Tom is back to guide us through the questions. I, you all do not need to be guided. <laughs> first, <laughs> first, first of all, I, I was just gonna, uh, you know, before we shift to a couple of questions here, I, I was just gonna say, I, 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 this is, you know, my, however many programs, radio and, and, and online like this, um, enjoying, listening to you all. And, you know, I, I learned so much just through the course of, you know, watching a book um, as a publisher and watch it evolve and the ups and the downs and the debates uh, and the time that passes, um, you learn so much. And that's what I love about what we do is you just every, every project you get to learn so much, but I've learned so much just watching the project become a book. And then it never ceases to amaze me how much more I learn just in each program, even though some of the questions and topics are universal. Every time each of you come, come to them, with something else and so differently. Um, I really um, I really appreciate that. And, and I wanna add, I think I'm comfortable, Kathy, um, you know, going out on our limb and, and definitely reiterate, yes, we're far along in our, our talks, which are not complicated about the coloring book. And a coloring book is uh, certainly 
unconventional for a university press and we are not in the least afraid to be unconventional so i am you know super excited about the um the very unique prospects um for for this in coloring book form and 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 um like i said those planning talks are far along so everybody should look forward to that um in the near future uh one question let's see appeared over here in chat it was particularly um interesting I thought, uh, so did you guys, did you all agree on a common definition of revolutionary? Is revolutionary simply a change agent, someone who changed themselves and or the world around them? Or were there additional characteristics of, of revolutionary that you agreed upon? And, and I, would, I would like to append to that personally. Um, do you, if, if the answer to the latter kind of leans in that direction, do you, do you think these are kind of universals in, in, in time in terms of what would define revolutionary? Or do you see that as something that's evolving in, in, in light of contemporary circumstances? Well, I certainly think it's contemporary. It's looking back, you know, even historically, that I think if we could ask these women, were you revolutionary? I don't think that they would answer to that prescribed definition that most of us attribute as a, a male kind of a thing. A change agent uh, is, is really impactful. Uh, did they start, start out to be change agents? No, I don't think so. I think because the course of their activity and what they participated in, we now look at it you know, and see it as being revolutionary. So the definition is one that we kind of came upon as we discussed the, the actions by these women. And we came up with the, the differences in, the, um, in looking at that and redefining the word revolution. So the, the, there's sort of a double definition in, 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 in the book. Um, actions threatening to the established order and a transformative process that makes society new. So that was the, how we looked at revolution as a category for inclusion in the, in the, in the volume. So that, um, you know, take for instance, the Virgen de Guadalupe. Virgen de Guadalupe is the biggest part of why this whole hemisphere is Christian and mostly Catholic. She, whether, whether you think of her as uh, a vision sent from God or the most incredible advertising spokesperson you know, ever in the history of the universe or both, she, uh, allowed and welcomed the conversion uh, and, and made it happen, made the conversion acceptable to a, a population that had a different, a different religion. So, you know, if that isn't revolutionary, I don't, I don't know what is. And Malinche is in that same, that same category. Uh, but every woman who, uh, picks up a microphone for the first time or goes to the school district and said, you are, you are not going to force my child into a Mexican school. He is going to have the same education as anybody else or uh, any other kind of activism. And the other great thing I think, you know, and I'm just saying this from a selfish point of view is that we included artists in this group. You know, there are artists uh, cause revolution too. Artists take action threatening to the social to the social order, the established order too, because there was a certain time when I don't care how great you were, you were a woman artist, you weren't an artist. And maybe you didn't even get recognition for being that. So, um, you know, whether you're an artist or an activist or an educator, or you sell every last thing you have, including your goat to start a newspaper to protest against Porfirio, Porfirio Diaz and, and proclaim the rights of minors and other workers. These are revolutionary women from their own uh, bailiwick, from their own point of view. 
No, really. and I, listening to that definition, Kathy, really expands the canon. We can include so many more women. Uh, there's a poet whom I call the first feminist poet of the Americas, Makwil Chochitsin, who was writing poetry way before the Europeans got here and was a feminist because she was writing about women out on the battlefields. And that parallel with the soldaderas is there. I mean, it was practice. They, the women went out there and tended to the men, the warriors, but they were out there too. So even somebody like that, or Jovita Idar, having to battle the Texas Rangers with her printing press and her family's uh, publishing. So there are so many that would fit that category because they're doing things uh, partly out of their own volition, but also their circumstances that places them in a, in a position where they can't not be revolutionary just by yeah. doing what they need to do. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, is there another question, Tom? I'm... Yeah, I, well, and I just wanted to say, I should have acknowledged that question was from Roseanne Sullivan Tolson. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, um, uh, um, Bernadette Tabhan mentioned before, and Ellen, you touched on this, the talk about um, the point about passion. Um, I like to ask to what degree, it seems like a book like this is, is more than this, an arm's length engagement and observation, but it's a call to action in its own way to look inward, like at your own families uh, or your own communities uh, uh, and, and, and see the revolutionary acts in everyday life that otherwise are just things that pass or, 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 or complaints or problems of the day or challenges of the day or folkloric stories that are just passed down in a family. Um, and and uh, I'd like each of you or whoever would like to comment just about the power in the everyday and, and how someone else commented that just learning about Let's, this is right. Thank you. Thank you for thank saying you. that because we haven't spoken yet about the Valientas, you know, the group that we're calling the Valientas. So we've got the Valentinas, who are the soldaderas, and we romanticize them, and we've taken their picture, and, and we have a vision of them, and we know that they partook in the revolution. But there was a whole other group, the ones who actually started this project, you know, without knowing it, that came, gave up everything they had, came to the United States, many with little kids, and started over as laundresses, as whatever the whatever they could do to put food on the table and raise their kids, and this is really interesting because when we were dealing with the the essay about Lionel's grandmothers, and you know El, uh, Ellen suggested Valientas, which I think is a perfect name for them, the brave ones, because they hadn't been categorized, they hadn't they hadn't been given a name, and uh, and. You know, even in the family, it, the, the men kept popping up over and over again. You know, oh, I had this uncle who did this and I had this other uncle who was very dramatic and did that and this other uncle who uh, left the family and joined the US Army during the Mexican Revolution to play the clarinet. Meanwhile, it was the two grandmothers who were the heroes of the family and we are not, we don't, tell that we don't glorify them in that way they held everybody together they kept those kids safe on that whole journey and they settled into some place where they knew nobody and they had nothing and they whatever credential they had before did not wouldn't get them a job in in uh, texas uh if they if they had a job outside the home and they and so they are the they are the real heroes and yet you know, it was when my uncle came who had the doll factory in Mexico City, he came to visit and we all go crazy and go run and hug him and blah, blah, blah. So let, you know, let me bring this let up about, <laughs> let me bring this up about the issue of just storytelling and, and who tells the story as Kathy's saying at the dinner table or getting together and who is the, who are the, pre the presents that dominate those conversations. And who are the ones that dominate the conversations as they cook and as they clean up and whatever. And that's where a lot of stories are told. And I think that 
that right now, 20, yes, we can talk about all these women, but 2021, we have a lot of valientas right now. And I can tell you about the valientas just in my family with my granddaughters, all of them in very um, male dominated fields and in schools where they're not supposed to be as females, much less as Latinas. So every day, every, every day, they have valiente acts that they do. And so we need to encourage that storytelling at the formal dinner table to talk about those, those issues that it's not just the men. The young woman that I just read about who got is an Eagle Scout. I mean, talk about a valiente. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Juani Torres to me is today's San Antonio valiente. Um, mentored by people like Mary, well, you know, Maria Antonieta Berisabo, but who are these young women that are our legacy and that we have to tell that what you're doing is revolutionary and revolutionary acts planned or unplanned, just your daily living are valid and you need to reflect on them and to share them among all because we haven't defined all those qualities and characteristics. What is it, you know, what's the role of determination in these women? What's the role of optimist, being an optimist? What is the role of being brave? Um, all, all of those are qualities that we have never really discussed in terms of the female world. And so it's time for us to garner, garner all that passion and to make the voice heard in whatever way that we can ha have it heard so that the young little girls, I just saw a YouTube thing of a young African-American little girl doing the Selena song. And she's dang, I mean, she's four years old and her dad says some, something to her and she says, canta and he doesn't understand the Spanish. She says, sing and then she goes, oh well. <laughs> and she continues with her singing of a song that to her expressed who she was at four years old. So that's what I'm talking about. The, the storytelling that we have is, is valuable, not from just a literary point of view, but from an academic point of view, a psych, psychological point of view, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, one of the uh, comments from Mireya is, she says, learning about them is revolutionary. And I would say, yes, learning about women like this is revolutionary. The other part, and that's what you're talking about, Ellen, is to go out and act and do yourself, because that is uh, the revolutionary act in the daily, in the quotidian day-to-day -day struggle of just surviving for many, many women. And the other part that I, it keeps going through my head is that yes, 1910, all those women that came, but how many other women were here and survived mm -hmm. through sheer uh, courage to survive and tenacity to make things happen for their families, for their kids. Uh, this has been wonderful. I know we've done this before, but it's new every time. <laughs> so and we have another one, no, don't we? At the Texas the Book Fair. Yes. By the way, Norma, the the illustration of Madre Conchita, uh, that is a black and white drawing of uh, my conception of an otome, an otome with you, because she's after after all of her, you know trouble with the, you know, the, the Cristeros and after she had gotten out of jail and everything like that, she spent her last years working with the Otome peoples. So every illustration has some kind of illustration that speaks to her story. And that was, that's one of hers. Well, maybe then we could also have um, an exhibit where you could have signage and explain some of these things because that really is amazing. I had no idea. It is Otomi. Now that you mention it, I recognize it from the embroideries. 
Yes. Yeah, I try. I tried to put a s symbolism in each. In each, some of them are more obvious than others, but all of them have s something that, to me, is representational of their story or their personality. And we have well, a couple I, more questions, Tom. I, I hate to do this, but I'm we're right at an hour, so um, <laughs> I, I can tell from some of the comments and questions we could we could certainly go on and on, but as long as you brought it up for those listening live, yes, uh, you, there's a panel this Friday at the Texas Book Festival where we can continue this, this discussion for, for certain. Um, so please uh, please join me and, and everyone in thanking Kathy, Ellen and Norma for sharing their time with us tonight. Um, for more, I'm, I'm asked to tell you that for more information on future webinars and podcasts, please visit trinity.edu forward slash alumni. Uh, if you've not already, a reminder to order this engaging book. Um, if you've already ordered, order additional copies for those folks in your life who could benefit uh, from reading it and, uh, and support the work of Trinity University Press along the way. Uh, we'll post the promotional code and link again in the chat box here at the end. Thank you so much for joining us. And on behalf of the Trinity Tigers, have a good night. Good night. Night, Good night, Ellen. Night, Norma. Night, Tom. Night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs>